Hello, I'm Jennifer Bean from the University of Washington. This 1912 film, Falling Leaves, represents one of the few surviving films directed by Alice Guy Blaché at the Solak Studio in New York, a studio that the young but very experienced and talented woman owned and supervised between 1910 and 1914. This opening shot introduces us to a doctor, played by Mace Greenleaf. The action here is quite simple, showing us and the doctor's colleagues, the various patients that have benefited from his wonderful new cure for consumption. The action, as I said, is quite simple, but it is worth noting that these figures enter and exit through a door located at the right side of the frame. For as we will see, doors, windows, and sometimes the very edges of the frame play a prominent role in how this film tells its story. Now, this second shot moves us to the film's dominant location, the well-to-do family home, and stages the central dramatic crisis, which deals with the illness of a young woman, Winifred, played by Marion Swain, who suffers from tuberculosis or consumption. We are also introduced to her mother, played by Blanche Cornwall, and to her younger sister, Little Trixie, played by Magda Foy, who is also known to the press as the Solax Kid. The interactions between the three females in this scene establishes both an aura of domestic unity and the sense that the day-to-day -day routines are in crisis, which is conveyed here as Winifred has moved to the piano to play and little Trixie positions herself slightly to the side, beginning to sing along, but the performance is interrupted when Winifred collapses, coughing, unable to continue. As you can see, the drama is conveyed almost exclusively through the movement of the figures. In fact, you will note that the camera is very still. It frames the space, as if giving the viewer a privileged theater seat, but never cuts up that space with editing or reframing techniques. Rather, it is the actor's gestures, movements, and their placement in the scene that generates dramatic tension. Here, little Trixie's quietly furrowed brow and concerned look are juxtaposed with her mother's hurried, rushing in and out at the back of the frame. The contrast between the two types of movement gives a certain texture to the drama and builds to dramatic pathos as the two figures come together. The mother here explaining we can assume what is happening and they comfort one another. Although the acting in this film may appear histrionic to us today, it was quite subtle in relation to the standards of 1912 and is directly tied to Guy Blaché's direction. In fact, visitors to the Solak studio often commented on the sign that she mounted to the wall as a reminder to her actors. It read simply, be natural. In this third shot, again, notice the setup of the camera, which is designed to neatly frame the room, and again the door, which Guy Blaché clearly uses to suggest an off-screen space the characters enter and return from, even when the camera does not follow them. Following the doctor's pronouncement that Winifred will soon pass away, the crisis of the story builds. What is fascinating about this fourth shot is the intricate and sustained use of staging in deep space to help align us with little Trixie's perspective. Notice here that we are introduced for the first time to the father, played by Darwin Carr, to whom we will return. And his figure, along with the other adults, is positioned squarely in the front center of the room. Now, this is ostensibly the dominant action of the scene. But it is not the only action. Guy Blaché offers two overlapping perspectives here. One is that of the parents receiving the bad news from the doctor, and the other that of the eavesdropping Trixie, who is visible in the far recesses of the room as she ducks behind furniture and walls. At least, she is visible to the viewer, although she is never noticed by any of the adult characters throughout the duration of this scene. Sadly, we no longer have many of Guy Blaché's films from this same time left to compare with Falling Leaves. But other materials clarify that the use of deep space was central to her directorial style. It is telling, for instance, that press announcements regarding her plans for designing and building a new Solak studio, plans that coincided with the release of this film, 
described a large three-story building and emphasized the top floor, which would showcase a glass studio, described as splendid and spacious, affording ample room for the setting of the scenes. As Solak's treasurer and sales representative George A. Meiji was quoted as saying, deep pictures are what we are after. Thus far, we have seen Guy Blaché's magisterial use of deep space, but the sequence of shots beginning here shows a slightly different technique, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's first note that as with all of the shots thus far, the camera is positioned to neatly frame the room. And when the film returns to this room, as when it returns to any room, the camera will repeat the identical setup from before, thus helping to naturalize the movement between different spaces and create a sense of visual continuity. But as I said, the pattern is slightly different here. This time when a character leaves a room, here little Trixie sneaking out at night, the camera follows her. And for the first time in this film, we have a scene that is comprised of several different shots rather than a single shot. These three successive shots match the action of the little girl's movement through the house, opening one door after another, and ultimately moves with her outside to where the leaves are falling from the trees. Orchestrated directly in the center of the film, this shot pattern is well-paced and beautifully done. It provides a different sense of movement in the film, which accentuates the moving pathos of the child's almost lyrical logic. That she tie the leaves back onto the trees so her sister will not die. The emotion and pathos of this short film is so artfully achieved that it would be easy to imagine that Guy Blaché specialized in family dramas of this sort. But Darwin Carr's appearance in this film as the father, we mentioned a moment ago, although a minor character in Falling Leaves, helps remind us that domestic melodramas like this one were only one part of Guy Blaché's output. Since Carr was well known as a stage comedian, it was clear that he was hired to augment the company's comedy productions. In fact, in 1911, after successfully recruiting another experienced comedian, Billy Quirk, who had starred in comedy films for both the Pate and Biograph companies, Guy Blaché informed a reporter for the Moving Picture News that, we are making an emphatic effort to organize a perfect comedy company. We want to be known as the best comedy producers in the business. And this was not all. Along with comedies and family dramas, Solax also released a number of military films, as well as a wide variety of dramas dealing with either the sins of gambling or the sins of a woman, a vamp-like figure who has lost her virtue. Historian Alison McMahon groups these latter films together in what she alternately calls the forgiveness films or the redemption films, terms that usefully foreground the focus throughout these stories of a character who needs to be saved or redeemed. In the film we are watching, it is not moral redemption, but physical recovery that is at stake. And it is recovery that we get. Dr. Earl Headley's sudden coincidental appearance outside the family home, in the middle of the night, no less, at the very moment that little Trixie is tying the leaves back onto the trees, dramatizes a reversal of fortune typical of the traditional melodrama. But regardless of the outcome of the story, this film is neither typically nor commonly staged or shot. It is rather quite unique a mark of Guy Blaché's resounding success and key to the respect that she earned throughout the first few decades of motion picture production. As one reviewer proclaimed in 1917, after watching Guy Blaché's film, The Adventurer, this reviewer has yet to see a picture by Madame Blaché that was not sincerely and artistically directed. Guy Blaché was one of many women directors in the silent era, many of whose films and even names have been lost or forgotten, and whose work we are struggling to recover today. Even so, given the prominence of Guy Blaché's status in the young industry, we are left wondering why more women did not thrive, or continue to thrive, as directors in the cinema. 
This question was one that Guy Blaché asked as well. And in an essay she wrote for Photoplay magazine in 1914 on woman's place in photoplay production, she said this. There is no doubt in my mind that a woman's success in many lines of endeavor is still made very difficult by a strong prejudice against one of her sex doing work that has been done only by men for hundreds of years. There is nothing connected with the staging of a motion picture that a woman cannot do as easily as a man, and there is no reason why she cannot completely master every technicality of the art. The technique of motion picture photography, like the technique of the drama, is fitted to a woman's activities. Fitting indeed. Neatly fitting as well is the closing shot of this film, which follows the integrity of the style established throughout Falling Leaves. Here we have the action in the center and fore of the plane, and in a moment, little Trixie, entering through the door, working in the back, deep recesses of the plane. Working, in fact, is something of a director, directing her parents out the door, leaving the happy and healthy couple alone in the film's final balanced frame.